Carter, can you give me just a little bit more on this, please, on the volume? All right. Grab your Bible. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. What a great time of worship, huh? Amen, amen. Yeah, thank you both of y'all for that. Okay, so, um, yeah, thank you. What a great time of worship. Oh, all right. That was very nice. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I know Grayson just thanked Tracy and Mo and, and all the workers uh, for, for Kids Camp. Um, hey, by, by the way, if, if you can, if you are physically able, like not too tired, okay, Kids Camp workers, could you just stand to your feet and let us give you one more round of applause and thank the Lord for you? All right. Yes. So great, so great. Such a, such a, well, a powerful uh, few days. Um, so thank the Lord for that. And hey, by the way, you know, uh, it was a busy week. The WMU is in full force, uh, feeding lunch to about 300 people uh, a couple times this week. And so uh, thank the Lord for you, WMU, and uh, for all your work. Uh, would you like to stand too? You want to, WM, you ladies, go ahead and rise to your feet. All right. Yes, yes. Amen to that. Amen to that. Well, all right, my friends. Well, let me pray for us before we dive into the word this morning. Lord, we want to thank you for a, a great week, a great week of ministry and a great time of worship already this morning, Lord. Uh, we want to thank you for our kids, for bringing the all those kids our way, those 43 campers who were at uh, the kids' camp this week, and for those 17 workers, Lord, just thank you for each and every one of them, and I want to pray that uh, how you spoke to those children would uh, just linger on and grow more powerful in their hearts, and for those workers that you have blessed them for uh, for the time they spent with the children, and uh, just all the energy they dished out during this week, so Lord, bless them. Take care of our WMU ladies, expand their ministry. We want to thank you for, for all they do uh, for us and how they pray for us and, and, and work, Lord. So thank you uh, for them as well. And we love you. We want to pray that you would speak to us today as we focus on you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So today we're, by the way, you see Malachi 3. Some of you are like, uh-oh, I think I know that passage. Dun, dun, dun. It's the money passage, right? It's the money passage. Yeah, can I get an amen? Yeah, just some cheerful givers out there. Woohoo! I know, y'all settle down. All right, yes. All right, so uh, today we're talking about it's a matter of trust from Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3. So really, uh, all of my money messages, not like I have a whole lot of money messages, right? But, uh, but I always start them out the same way uh, with this did you know? Because there's some interesting things about money in Scripture uh, that I want you to know about. And so, so I want to repeat these to you um, before we start the message. Did you know that the number one theme of the parables of Jesus is our relationship to our possessions? So that ought to perk your ears up. Did you know that there are more than 2,250 Bible verses about money in the Word? Did you know that more is said in the New Testament about our relationship to our possessions than about prayer, health, and faith all combined. That's a lot. That stewardship is the number two theme of the New Testament, second only to salvation. And so that just lets us know that God is very concerned with my relationship with my money, with your relationship with your money, with your stuff. That God is very concerned about how you view and how you treat your stuff. And really, just like every other aspect of our walk with the Lord, it really is a matter of trust. It really comes down to, Lord, do I trust you in this moment? We started off our relationship with him in a trust relationship. When you place your faith or your trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation, you became part of the family. And then after that, every single day, we wake up and we say, Lord, you are my Lord today. So therefore, Lord, I trust you today, and I'm going to live my life your way today. Because our relationship with the Lord is a matter of trust. It's a matter of faith from the very beginning to the very end. It is a matter of trust. And so we go to the Old Testament book of Malachi. So all you have to do 
If you're not familiar with this small book, is go to Matthew and hang a left, right? And there you are in Malachi. There you are in Malachi. Okay? All right. All right. So first thing to do is this. Trust. Trust the Lord that God is the Lord Almighty. Just trust that God is the Lord Almighty. You need look no further. He is the Lord. There is no one higher than him. There should be no one higher than him in your life, that he is the Lord Almighty. God is referred to as the Lord Almighty 20 times in the 54 verses of the book of Malachi. And the name Malachi means messenger, as if Malachi is sending us a message that he is the Lord Almighty. He is the highest one. There is no one higher to live for or serve, there is no one higher to go to for our authority. So 20 times in 54 verses, the Lord Almighty. But it is each of our responsibility to make sure that the Lord is the Lord of our lives, that he is actually the Lord Almighty, and that the Almighty dollar does not take its place, because this $1 bill is sneaky. The Almighty dollar is sneaky. The almighty dollar thinks it really is the Lord Almighty. And it tries to to sell that message to you and kind of creep that message into your heart and to your mind that really this life is really, when it gets right down to it, all about the materialism, materialism, the stuff, the money, right? And that's what this little dollar bill will say to you. But, hey, we're smarter than that. We're wiser than that. We are the people who say, no, Lord, You are the Lord Almighty. We're not going to reduce ourselves down to reducing legal tender. No, Lord, that will not happen in our life. So we're going to trust, Lord, that you are the Lord Almighty. And we're going to bring that idea into our lives, into our hearts, and live that way. And we're also going to trust that the Lord Almighty is faithful. That the Lord Almighty is faithful. Answering the very foundational question of, Lord, if I live my life your way, are you going to be faithful to me? Are you going to be faithful? Is that in your character, Lord? Look at verse 6 and 7. I, the Lord, do not change. So you, O descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Now understand, the people that Malachi is speaking to, God's children, are uh, on a path of disobedience right now. They're on a path of disobedience. And it is time for the Lord to judge them, quite frankly. But the Lord says, I, the Lord, do not change. So, O descendants of Jacob, they're not destroyed. And ever since the time of your forefathers, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. You've not been faithful to me, the Lord says. You've been running away from me. You've been disobedient towards me. But I've made a promise to your forefathers. And I'm going to keep my promise. I will be faithful to you. So despite the unfaithfulness of his people, the Lord Almighty will remain faithful to his word not to destroy Israel. Although, quite frankly, their disobedience deserved that. But the Lord is always faithful to receive and to forgive and to cleanse those who return to him. And he is calling for this in this passage right here to his children who have gone wayward. And he's calling, making that call to those right now in this room and those watching online who are far from him right now, who are walking away from him. Maybe not just in the area of your giving, it may be some other area of your life that you're not being obedient to him in. But he's saying, please come back to me Please come back to me because when you come back to me, I will receive you and I will forgive you and I will cleanse you and I will close that gap between you and I. I will take away that distance and we can be close once again. This is a clear call of repentance, a clear call for God's children to turn around because they're not living for him in this particular moment. But we must also trust that the Lord Almighty's discernment is correct. 
Because there are some people when the Lord, maybe even in this time right here, definitely in this time right here, and we're going to see this in this passage, that it may be in this room, that when the Lord, we doubt his judgment. When the Lord gives judgment, gives his discernment, shows us our true condition. Let me put it that way. That some of us doubt that's true. We're like, oh, Lord, we start making excuses. Oh, Lord, I'm really not that bad. Oh, Lord, you must have this wrong. You must be thinking about someone else because who you really need to look at is this person over here, right? I mean, I may be kind of not, not so great, but this person over here is just straight bad, right? So you need to quit looking at me, please, Lord, and look over here to them because, quite frankly, Lord, I think you're barking up the wrong tree, and I don't think you have all the information, and I think you're wrong on this. And we don't trust the Lord's discernment. But when the Lord comes to us and speaks to us and says, in this area of your life, in whatever area of your life he may be speaking to you in, that you need to change some things around in this area of your life and come back to me, what the wise person does at that point is they say, yes, Lord, you know everything about my heart. You know everything about my intentions. You know everything about my actions. And, Lord, I'll agree with you, and I will come back to you. The Lord says to the people in Malachi, chapter 3, Ever since the time of your forefathers, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But then they have doubts, and they do this all throughout the book. They do this all throughout the book. So the Lord will say something to them. You haven't obeyed my decrees? And they're like, what? What are you you talking about, Lord? You must be mistaken. But you ask, how are we to return? In other words, like, what what do we need to return to you for, Lord? We're not far away from you. We think we're very close to you. So, Lord, we don't agree with your assessment that we are far away from you. We think we're close to you. Why in the world would we need to return to you? He says, will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. The Lord says to them, and then they may go, oh, but you ask, how do we rob you? They, they're still not getting it. They're still not getting it. God shows them the obvious. And they're like, well, how can we rob you, Lord? We're not doing that. And then the Lord tightens the screws down a little bit and gets a little more obvious with them and says in tithes and offerings. And tithes and offerings. He shows them the obvious. See, many times we may play the same game as the Israelites do in Malachi. We kind of live in this world of the shades of gray. The Lord says, you're far away from me. And we say, no, Lord, I'm not really far away from you. I'm not that far. Everything's okay. I don't need to come back to you. I don't need to repent, really, Lord. Everything is fine, but the Lord gives them an obvious black and white. He shows them something very obvious that you can't go all shades of gray with, and that area is their money. He lays that right to them and says, hey, are are you giving what you should be giving, or are you not giving what you should be giving? And in that particular moment, it is what it is, right? At that particular moment, Everyone in the room understands what God already knew as he points out the obvious. And they're thinking to themselves, wow, I am, we are being unfaithful in this moment in Malachi chapter 3. It's hard to be fully surrendered and in love with the God that you are stealing from. Can I get an amen? I mean, it's hard to be like, God, I love you. God, I'm passionately for you. God, I'm serving you with all my heart. Let me take your money. Difficult. If someone were robbing from you, would you say that that person loves you? You know, for your birthday, for Christmas, maybe even Valentine's Day, what I want to do for you is take a cool grand out of your bank account without letting you know. How about that? Maybe we can meet on the street and I can just rob you that way. Why would you do that? Well, it's an innocent act of love. I want to show my love to you. Happy birthday. How about your money? You know what I'm saying? This fan is humming over here. Can y'all hear this fan? It's about to take off. Anyway, it's hard to be fully surrendered and in love with the God that you're stealing from. I 
pray that today that you're not one who is stealing from God. That you're not stealing from God and coming in here and singing worship songs and coming to church and lifting hands of praise and false pretense to the Lord. And might I just say this, and I do mean this in love, for some of us, this is the missing piece to your spiritual growth. This is what you've been holding out on the Lord for so long. You're too stubborn to give, maybe too selfish to give, maybe just too tight to give, or maybe you're just out of the habit of giving. But for whatever reason, you stopped right there, just like we talked about last week, being shipwrecked in your faith. Remember that? That wherever you become shipwrecked, you just stop right there and you sink to the bottom. That you're stuck on the sand. And for some of us in the room and watching online, this area right here, if you were to come to terms with this, if you were to come to terms of trusting the Lord with your money, it would free your spiritual life up in ways that you've only dreamed of. In fact, you may be asking the question, well, what was the difference maybe in, you know, my grandfather who loved the Lord and had a powerful walk with the Lord and me? Or someone in your life that you know was on fire for the Lord and was all legit and all for real in their relationship with the Lord? And you're surveying the landscape. And it may just be that they came to terms with who is Lord over their stuff. And then we're still, some of us, still like maybe the, the child in the playpen that just grabs the toy away from the other kid and says, mine, mine, mine. We're still trying to answer that basic question of who does all this stuff belong to? Who does my stuff belong to? And then we, if we could all come to the realization that all of my stuff and all of your stuff, all of our stuff belongs to the Lord. Because he's the one who gave it in the very first place. You say, oh, I'm the one who works those long hours to get what I got. I say, that's true. And the Lord gave you strength to do that. And the Lord could cut your strength off right now, and your money goes, <laughs> you understand that, right? You get that, right? Sure we all get that. It's hard to be fully surrendered and in love with the God that you're stealing from. We also must trust that the Lord Almighty will not be mocked in any issue, in any way, and certainly not in this area. And he says you're under a curse. Well, hello. You're under a curse. So what do we mean a curse? Does that mean like, like, like the medicine man at the old uh, Memphis Chicks games? If anybody, does anybody remember the, the medicine man? So, all right. But like somebody puts a curse on you, woo! Is that what he's talking about? No. God doesn't do that. Well, let's see you're under a curse being that the Lord is working against you. That the Lord is working against you. Because you set yourself up against him in this particular area. You are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. I mean, understand from an individual or a family or a nation that when you rob somebody, it's a hostile act. It's a hostile act. Let's also trust this as we're coming to terms with, with the money from Malachi chapter 3. Trust the Lord Almighty with your money, pure and simple. You can do that. He is faithful. Trust him with your money. For many of us, that's the second most precious commodity in our lives, behind our family, would be our money. And you can trust him with that. Some of us just say, Lord, can you bring me to the place where I can trust you with my children? Lord, please put us in that position, Lord. We just trust you with our children. Lord, however you want to use our children, 
Please do that. And that's difficult, is it not? Especially for those parents whose children are getting out of the house now. They're going off to school now. You don't see them every day. You don't see them all the time. You call them, they don't answer, things like that after school. Okay? Barry, you listening? No, I'm just kidding. All right. So you have that, right? And so you're just saying, you're just saying, Lord, take care of my children. Lord, take care of my money. I'm going to be faithful to you with my money. Lord, because I can trust you with my money. And you'll be faithful in return to me. So bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. That's what 3 verse 10 says. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. So where is the storehouse? The storehouse is the modern-day local church. So you bring your tithe to the modern-day local church. You can give to other ministries. There are other worthy things to give to. Make sure you bring your tithe to the local church, to the storehouse. But also trust that the Lord Almighty is about his glory. At the end of all this, the Lord is concerned about his glory and not your glory. Okay? This is, as they say, it's all about him. This is not about us. This is not about the prosperity gospel. This is not about, Lord, if I give to you, you're going to make me rich. It's not about that. This is, Lord, this is for your glory. This is, Lord, if I'm faithful to you, you'll be faithful to me, and I can testify to that with my friends. When I say, we didn't have the money to give, but we gave, and the Lord saw us through. That's the Lord putting the spotlight back on himself. And understand your money, how much or how little, it doesn't really matter, is all about God's glory. Some people may ask the question, well, what would you do if you got a million dollars? If you had a million dollars, what would you do with it? I would just say the same thing you would do if, if you got one dollar. You'd be generous with it or selfish with it. Either way, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. For what purpose? For what purpose? That there may be food in my house. See, we would like for this more, maybe maybe more to say, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there be maybe food in my house, as in like the Linhaus house. So we see tithing like this. Lord, if I give to you, you're going to make sure that my house is always totally full. And the Lord says, I'll take care of you, but bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. There may be food in my house. What's the point? The point is that the Lord thinks that his house is more important than your house. That's the point. The Lord's saying, you take care of my house, and then you take care of your house. That's why you give off a top. You don't wait till the end of the month to make sure to see if you if the ends meet. It's a matter of priority because the Lord sees his house as higher than your house. The Lord wants his house taken care of more than he wants your house taken care of. Because his house is more important. And so in our house, meaning Bartlett Hills, in the Lord's house, he gives us opportunities to do kids' camp. And so the Lord says, I want to make sure there's enough resources in my house to reach 43 kids, that they'll hear the gospel. That this local house, this local church, wouldn't have to make decisions, well, can we do kids camp or can we not do kids camp? Would it be a wise use of our money if we did kids camp or would it not be? Can we make that happen? And quite frankly, there are are some ministries, I'll just be straightforward with you, There are some ministries that we would like to do but can't afford to do. On the other side of that, we realize, Lord, this is what you have for us right now to accomplish. But the Lord says, bring your tithe into the storehouse to make sure that my house is taken care of. That these 43 kids can be taken care of and and hear the gospel and have a great time. They will have an unforgettable time. They look back on this. Because 
you were faithful in your giving, because you trusted the Lord with your money, and you said, this is a good investment. Lord, I trust you with my money. I have my priorities in order. Your house is more important than my house. I'm going to give off the top, and here it is. And great things happen. Let's also trust the Lord Almighty to prove himself. You can do that. Trust the Lord Almighty to prove himself. And the Lord says, test me in this. Test me in this. Now, in other places we see the Lord say, like Jesus in, his, in Luke chapter 4, to not test the Lord. I was wondering to myself, what's the reconciliation point in that? Are we to test the Lord? Or are we not to test the Lord? Or could it be that the Lord is saying, I understand how difficult it is for you in your financial life when you're on a fixed income, when you wish you were farther ahead than you are, when you're not making any much money at all, or if you're somewhere in the middle of all this, for all of us, it's difficult to trust the Lord with our stuff, with our finances. That you have to come once again to a particular place in your spiritual growth for that to happen to say, Lord, I trust you with my money, so therefore I'll give. I'm just wondering to myself, is that why the Lord said, well, try me in this, T test me in this. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. Now, understandably, there are different ways to bless you other than the almighty dollar. The peace of knowing that you're obedient, right? The joy that that brings into your life. Other things. But this is one of the ways that the Lord will take care of you if you're obedient to him. John Phillips, are you familiar with that author? You should read John Phillips. He's great. Here's what he said about this. He says, God is no man's debtor. God is no man's debtor. The more we give to him, the more he gives to us. That principle holds true for us in the age of grace as it did for Israel in an age of law. Any believer with a good heart and a pure motive can put this principle of giving and receiving to the test for himself. I love that, that God is no man's debtor. So God's not going to put him, himself in a position where I could ever say to him, God, I've outgiven you, you owe me. God's going to make sure that doesn't happen in any way, shape, or form. And so we're also going to trust for the Lord Almighty to provide. Lord, we understand at the end of this, you are going to provide for our needs. So once again, the Lord says, test me in this, says the Lord, and see if I will not open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have enough room for it. So we will receive certain things from the Lord, but also the Lord will prevent certain things from happening and protect us in that way and provide for us in that way. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines in your fields will not cast their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all you nations, all the nations will call you blessed. For yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. And so on one side of the coin, when you give you are be, and being obedient to God, you're positioning yourself for God's blessings. That's important. That's important. In every single area of your life, not just the financial, but for you to position yourself because of your obedience to the Lord, to position yourself to receive blessings from the Lord. That's important for individuals and for churches, to be obedient to the Lord. It puts you in a position to be blessed by the Lord. But flip the coin over, when you choose not to give, you're not just robbing God, you're also robbing yourself of God's blessing. And this is true in any area of your life. When you choose not to obey in any area of your life, you are not putting yourself in a position for God to bless you. Very important to understand. Also, trust that serving the Lord Almighty is not in vain. 
Because I understand that some of us may be thinking just that. Ah, I just don't know. That, that's, that's really, for some of us, what we need to wrestle to the ground and come to the realization that if I serve the Lord, is it truly worth it or not? Yes, it is. That you're not just serving the Lord in vain in the area of your money or any other area of your life. Being, being obedient to the Lord never returns in vain. So in verse 13 of Malachi chapter 3, it says this, You have said harsh things about against me, says the Lord. He's speaking to the people. He says, You have said harsh things against me, says the Lord. And once again, yet you just don't get it. And yet you ask, what have we said against you, Lord? What have we said against you? Either they're just playing stupid or just ignorant or just don't get it, not so sure. You have said it is futile to serve God. By the way, these are God's people that are saying it is futile to serve God. What did we gain by carrying out his requirements and going about like mourners before the Lord Almighty? What have we gained by serving the Lord? The children of God are asking this. What, what are we gaining by serving the Lord? Is it even worth it? They're coming to the conclusion that it's not. Because they're in the wrong place spiritually. Their heart is not in the right position to see the reality of their situation. I pray that's not you. I pray that's not me. But in verse 15, but now we call the arrogant blessed. Certainly the evildoers prosper. These are the people of the Lord speaking. Certainly the evildoers prosper, and even those who challenge God escape. And there was all the, God, all this stuff you're saying that's going to happen, and, and you're all awesome and fantastic and wonderful, and, and no one escapes you. But we're not seeing that. We're not feeling the blessings of your obedience right now. And then things turn on a dime. The conversation turns on a dime. In 16, then another group begins to speak. Then those who feared the Lord talked with each other. Well, that's a beautiful thing, right? That's a whole different conversation as opposed to the people who are not fearing the Lord, who are not living for the Lord, who do not have any reverence or respect for the Lord, whose hearts are far away from the Lord. They have a totally different conversation than these people right here, those who feared the Lord, talked with each other. Don't you understand that your conversation, when you talk with believers who are passionately following the Lord and fearing the Lord and living for him, is a totally different and more beautiful conversation than when you talk with believers who aren't. You can tell. You can tell. But then those who feared the Lord talked with each other, and the Lord listened and heard. A scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored his name. And they will be mine, says the Lord Almighty. In the day when I make up my treasured possession, I will spare them. Just as in compassion, a man spares his son who serves him. And you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked between those who serve God and those who do not. Which is borne out through their actions. Which is borne out through their speech. Which their heart is revealed by their conduct. The righteous and the wicked. The righteous and the wicked. So we, we can't play this game any longer with the Lord Act one way, act disobedient in our conduct, act disobediently in our giving, act disobediently in our attitudes, but then on the other hand, turn to the Lord and say, oh, no, Lord, I, I love you with my heart. In my heart of hearts, I really love you, Lord. The Lord's like, no, I see the truth. You can talk and run your mouth all you like to, but the Lord God can see your heart. which is revealed by the actions. All this, not just money in Malachi chapter 3, but all this, your entire life, really comes down to a matter of trust with the Lord. 
and how you live your life and the decisions that you make prove the fact whether in this particular moment of your life you're trusting the Lord in this area or not. I remind you, you want to put yourself in a place where you can honestly say to the Lord, you are the Lord Almighty. You are the Lord of my life. There is no area that I'm holding back from you. Because if I'm at an 80% clip, and 80% of Elliot is living for the Lord, I can't say to him in that moment, you are the Lord Almighty in my life, with me holding 20% back of any area of my life. Does this make sense? It's a matter of trust. It's a matter of trust. Your eternity is a matter of trust. Do you place your faith in Jesus Christ alone for salvation? Why do we do that as believers? Why have we done that as believers? Because we trust that he is the only way, he's the only one who can forgive us of our sins because of his death on the cross. He can pull off what he's talking about. And we believe that about the Lord Almighty. We trust you, Lord. We trust you with every area of our life, including our money. So let's pray that's true. Lord, let this ring true in our hearts, in our